Lord, as we just sang, abide with me. What, what more can we ask for as your people? That, that you abide with each and every one of us. There, there are so much other things going on in the world around us that, that drow, drowns out your words in our lives. So as we take the opportunity to stop, to breathe, to listen, we pray that you give us ways that we could continue to abide in you. So, Lord, as we continue in our series, we ask that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So, we are continuing our series in uh, the invitation to the Jesus life. And I want to, to kind of drive home the fact that, that living the Jesus life is more than just an invitation to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Yes, that is extremely, extremely important. That, that, that we all say that we are accepting who Jesus is and, and the work that he did on the cross for each and every one of us. But unfortunately, it comes to a point where sometimes that's all we do. We just accept that he is our Lord and Savior, and that's it. See, we are, are called to, to live into his life. Live, it, live into to what he has done and who he is so that that becomes a part of who we are. Last week, uh, both here in this sanctuary and over at New Hope Baptist, we talked about what it meant to be an attentive listener. And I pray that you had the opportunity to stop and listen. That, that you had the opportunity to, to take the, the, the ability to, to stop and just listen to, to what God is telling you through other people. I know I, I tried to do that several times, and, and uh, I caught myself a few times when I was listening to somebody and when I was listening to the, the, that person, I realized what I was doing was that I was listening so that I could respond to them. I was listening because I thought, oh, wait, I have a, a, a drop of wisdom or I have something that, that they need to hear. And, and when, I, when I share that with them, they're just going to be so blessed. And then I caught myself and went, wait a minute, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not supposed to be listening to see how I can respond to somebody. I am supposed to be listening so that I could hear what they are actually saying. And when I made that switch, when I made that change from, from listening to try to respond to listening to, to understand, a whole different world opened up to me in that conversation. And I realize that what they are saying is blessing me more than anything that I could ever say back to them. More than anything that I could share with them, their words are so much more important right now. And I need to hear what they have to say. Can you imagine what a different world we would be living in right now if we did that kind of listening? Can you imagine what kind of change we would see in relationships that we have inside this room, uh, outside this room, in, in the national discourse that we have going on right now, if we just stopped to listen, to understand, and not listen just to give our opinion? We're going to continue in our series, and today we're going to talk about compassion that flows. Compassion. I, I, I love that word. Whenever I think of the word compassion, I, I think of a, a certain ministry that maybe you all have heard about. It's called Compassion International. And, and the reason why that ministry exists is to help uh, feed and, and provide housing and education for, for children all across the country. 
But we'll get more into that here in a little bit. Our scripture gives us a picture of Jesus and his compassion. And our scripture is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles, or if you want to follow along with the words on the screen, you can follow along on the screen. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, and he was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What does compassion mean? When you think of the word compassion, what is it that you you hear? What is it that you think of? What, what is it that you, that you see? Webster's Dictionary, of course, has a definition of what compassion is, and it's, it's this. Compassion is sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. That's, that's, that's a, a great definition of compassion. And, and I think it's when we think about compassion, that, that's what we see compassion is all about. It is a, a sympathetic conscience of, a consciousness of others. It, it, it allows us to take the opportunity to try to see what is going on in other people's lives. And then continuing on it with, with a desire to alleviate it. You know, and, and I think that's something that we all have. And I think we could probably think of times in our own lives where, where we have had sympathy for someone. And we go, oh, man, I, I really wish there was a way to make that better. I, I wish there was really something that we can do ab- about that. And then we would move on with our lives. And, and we would leave it there. We may say a prayer here or there, but, but that is that is about as far as sometimes as that, that we can go with it. But, but if we were to stop and, and take a look at the, the Greek word for compassion, we can see that it goes a lot deeper than just trying to have a sympathetic conscience, consciousness of others to stress together with a desire to alleviate it. The Greek word says that it, 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 we, it gives you the opportunity to partake in that person's suffering, to partake in. That's more than just trying to wish someone well and and hoping things go well, but it is actually stopping and being a part of what is happening to another person. Looking at the Gospel of Matthew, we see that there are four times where Jesus is talked about having compassion on the crowds that were around him. And you may go, Pastor Chris, four times, that's, that's nothing. But, but if you look in the whole scope of, of the Gospel of Matthew, four times is a lot. Four times to remind us that, that when Jesus was out among his people, out among the Israelites, he had compassion on them, that, that he actually stopped in the midst of, of what was going on and focused his attention on those around him. We talked a little bit last week about how Jesus was dealing with this interruption of a woman that touched the, the hem of his, his clothes, But that was an interruption that this woman caused. But there are many times where Jesus stopped in the middle of what he was doing because of what was happening around him. And time and time again, we hear that Jesus would stop and heal those that came to visit him over and over and over again. 
interruption upon interruption because that, that compassion flowed through him so that others may, may receive the blessings that he has. Even if we go to the Gospel of Luke, we see that, that compassion was something that he did in the midst of, of the parables that he told. One of the most famous parables that, that we all could probably talk about just here is the parable of the prodigal son. And as Jesus was wrapping up this parable, he talked about the compassion that the father had for his son when Jesus said these words. But while he was still a long way off, talking about the son coming back home, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So what did he do? He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And we can continue the story where, where Jesus then said that the father had this, this great big giant party for the son who was lost and was found, who, who was now alive, who was once considered dead. That compassion to say, you are mine, and I welcome you back into the fold. See, that is the type of compassion that Jesus calls us as his disciples to continually to live into. Author Jan Johnson, she, she put it this way. As a way of life, Jesus could not pass up comforting the distressed, and he refused to be inattentive to the hardships of others. I want to say that one more time. Jesus could not pass up comforting the distressed, and he refused to be inattentive to the hardships of others. I don't know about you, but whenever I think about an invitation from, from Jesus, a way to live my life as his disciple, that's the way that I want to live. I, I, I want to comfort the distressed and, and, and to be attentive to the hardships of others, to see how, how I, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, can be there when others are indeed. So, so how do we do that? What, what, what are ways that, that we as followers of Jesus Christ can do that? First is one that I think that we all battle against, and I know I do, uh, do tremendously a lot, is that we need to fight against selfish ambition. How many times do we try to make it all about us, all about who I am, all about what I want? In order to be compassionate, you have to set that aside. Even though what you may want, even though what you may, may we want to, to acquire is a good thing, but to be lived a, a, a compassionate life, or to live with compassionate that flows, you need to make sure that you fight against those things to say, it's all about me. And the fact of the matter is that the best way to get around in this life is when we start thinking about how we can help benefit the other. Eugene Peterson has a paraphrase that you may be familiar with called the message. And in this message, he, he, wrote, he, he paraphrases 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, like this. Looking at it one way, you can say anything goes because of God's immense generosity and grace. We don't have to dissect and scrutinize every action to see if it will pass muster. But the point is not to just get by. We want to live well, but our foremost effort should be to help others live well. What, 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 what he's trying to say here, what, what Paul is really trying to say here is that sometimes it is so easy for us just to, to move through life going, well, yeah, that's going to be okay. It's not really hurting anyone because it's just for me. 
We don't have to dissect or, or scrutinize everything that we do just to see if it's, it's fine. But the fact of the matter is, if we are living our lives just to get by, then are we really living our life? If, if we're living our lives just to, to build up stuff for ourselves so, so that everything is well with me, is that what we really should be doing? I don't think so. I think every effort that we do should be an effort to help others to live well. Every, everything that we do should be a way for us to pass a blessing onto someone else. And, and the best way that we do that is if we, we, we tap down how we can build ourselves up and we look and see how we can build others up. And the best way that we can practice on how to build others up is to find places to practice compassion. I think I've admitted time and time again to you all that I, I'm, I'm a homebody. And, and, and believe it or not, I am more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. That, that, that I would much rather take time to, to sit down in front of the TV or sit down in front of my phone and just play games and not really care about anything else. And sometimes that has gotten me not really in trouble, but, but I, I have realized at times whenever I do stuff like that, I miss out on, on blessings that, that God has for me. See, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, says it in this way. Bear one another's burdens, and in that way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You know, as, as an introvert, when I'm, when I'm sitting at home by myself, when I'm in my office playing on uh, a game on my phone or, or, or trying to avoid the rest of the world, I'm not blessing anyone. I'm not bearing anyone's burdens, and I'm not fulfilling the law of Christ. That's why we are called to serve, my friends. That's why we are called to do more than just sit here one hour on a Sunday morning, but we are called to, to be a witness of God's love and grace to the world around us. And I can't think of a perfect time of the year to, to really think about this and to really focus on this than, than right now. Because we're, we're here at the beginning of the school year. We're here where, where there's a feeling of things that are, that are new and exciting. And, and, and we can do one of two things of that. We can say, oh, that's great. We'll, we'll, we'll just bless that and, and be happy that that's going on. Or, or, or we can roll up our sleeves and actually get involved with what's happening. We have partnered since I've been here with Davis Elementary School as, as our partner school. I know we've done that even beforehand, but I had a chance with uh, Cynthia Pence and Rachel Camp, who's the principal and vice principal over there, and I know they're opening up the campus again this year for volunteers to come and be on campus, and I am so excited for that. Because I have absolutely missed last year and, and the last half of, of 2020 school year uh, of not being able to, to go in and be with uh, an elementary school buddy where I had the opportunity to sit and talk and hear what's going on in their lives and, and give them, give, give them a, a, a person to, to, to confide in and figure out exactly how to do this thing that they call math now, which is so different from when I was in school. But, you know, I will admit there are times where I didn't want to go. And those who were in the office will probably remember the times where I would sit there and I would complain and go because I had way too much stuff that I needed to do in the office that I didn't have time to go and spend 30 minutes with a kid over at Davis Elementary School. But then whenever I would come back, I would be beaming. Beaming because that kid poured more into me than I ever poured in to them. And then there's other places to serve, too. You know, serve here in, as part of our welcoming ministry. Serve back on the AV booth, being a part of our daily bread food ministry, food pantry. 
Those are ways that you can say, you know what, for, for an hour I am going to give my service to, to the church or, or, or to the community. And I think about myself. Because in order to have compassion, you need to find a place to fill that compassion. I know uh, Lindsay mentioned that our website, we, we, we totally rebuilt our homepage of our website where you can find different uh, small groups that will be starting up here in, in September. I know we have the, um, the not the, uh, um, what, what y'all is called? What? The Soul Sisters, yes. They're starting September the 7th. Uh, God's Girls starting on the uh, 17th. I have a study that's starting on September the 1st in the morning and then at night during jam time. We got jam and sign up for jam is there. All of those learning opportunities are there, but there are serving opportunities too. The, the one plus one with Davis Elementary and then partnering with ECIA, which is over here at um, Camby, or, or, Earl Irby, Cam- Irby Campbell, man, I can't talk at all. Irby Campbell in 66, being able to go over there and volunteer there, volunteering around the church, all of those ways will allow you to say, this is where I am going to practice compassion this week to allow myself to serve as Christ has called us to serve. But, but, but there's one final thing that we have to remember when we talk about compassion. Remember how I talked about the Greek word had a lot more for us to to think about and to dissect besides just being sympathetic to those, what's happening around us, and having a desire to alleviate it. The Greek word reminds us that we must partake in it, which brings our last point that we must be okay with lament. And what I mean by that is that we must be okay when things aren't going well. We must be okay and take opportunities to stop and sit and be with someone that is hurting. We must be okay that that, that when we are asked to do something that we don't feel comfortable with or we think that it might infringe on my rights, that we do that because it's not Remember about us, it's about him. And it's about our relationship with him and others. Lament is a powerful thing, and we see it all throughout scriptures, especially through the Psalms. In the Psalms, there are 42 Psalms that are specific about lament, 42 out of 150 which if you think about that, that's quite a large number of lament psalms. 30 of them are our individual laments, while 12 of them are communal. And what, what that means is that 30 of them, people like David wrote them because he knew that things were going on in his life that he felt like he needed to, to share with God about what was happening. And the other 12 are just about the community of Israel that were saying, God, this is what's happening in our community. Please Watch and be with us. And we live in such a world now where we don't want to be sad. We don't want to deal with pain. We don't want to deal with with things that might bum us out. So we'll quickly try to, to move past them. Go back to normal, if you will. But instead the truest blessing that we could receive is living within these areas of lament and say, God, I need you to speak into this moment. I need you to speak into my life so that I can see you actively moving in my life. And for us sitting with those who are lamenting, we can see a blessing by being with those who mourn. So we're going to try something. I'm going to ask Richard to move over to the piano to, to play a little bit. And we're going to do a, a, a spiritual practice. I know I don't think I've ever done this uh, in a sermon before, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to sit and to listen. We're not going to have the words on the screen. 
We're, we're, we're not going to ask you to open up your Bibles and to, to read along. But I just want you to listen to these words from Psalm 56. And then pray through these words. Pray for these words and see how they can help you grow into the practice of being okay with lament and allowing that compassion to flow inside of you so that you can share the love and grace of Jesus Christ with others. So we'll go ahead and Richard will get started and then we will share in this psalm with one another. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long, and in their pride many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust and I'm not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All day long, they, they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire. They lurk. They watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offering to you. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. It's okay to lament because we see that example in Scripture. It's okay to sit with others when they lament. Because then we have the opportunity to see God's face there in the midst of others' sorrow and in the midst of others' pain. So as last week, actually you all didn't get them last week because of the uh, 11 o'clock service, but in your bulletin you'll see that there is a sheet for spiritual practices on compassion that flows. I invite you again to take this home and to practice some spiritual practice and see how you can build up compassion that flows just like it flowed free, freely from Jesus. Remember that, that these practices aren't a task that you pass and fail, but it's just an opportunity to, to share God's love with you. 
Don't, don't get trapped into a pattern. Don't think that you have to do it in a specific way. Allow the creativity of God to, to move through you so that you can do this in, in a way that, that allows you to grow closer to him. And remember, this is just a starting place. And, and if any of these don't work for you, try something else. Don't feel like that if you can't do it right or it doesn't feel like it's your thing that you failed. It just means that there is another practice out there to help you connect with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. My hope and my prayer is as we continue to grow and move through this series, that we find places where, where we open up our lives to allow God to fill in us so that we may share compassion with others. Let us pray. Oh God, as we spend this opportunity, seeing how, how throughout the Gospels and how those that have written the letters after the Gospels showed compassion over and over again, let that be a mark of who we are as Royce City First United Methodist Church. We try not to, to fight to do things our way so that, that, that we have what it is that, that we want or we desire, but help us to stop and look at others. Help us to look at others to allow your grace to fill our lives so that when we look at each other, we not only see brothers and sisters of Christ, we see you dwelling in us, and that spirit guiding us to fully live in your grace. So Lord, we lift this up to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.